a happy, healthy, beautiful day to you guys. Eric Higgins here, holistic health coach and actor calling out of Portugal in Portugal. I'm on a mission to impact the lives of 100,000 people with some holistic strategies that we can share all over the world in a simple way. And we're partnered with one of the best in the game of functional medicine, 30 plus years experience teaching people from all backgrounds to be their absolute best self through root cause medicine and applying information that actually brings your health and vitality up and allows you to do more with your life. We're talking some of the best athletes on the face of the planet, some of the best doctors who are open to functional medicine to up their game and their practice to really help their clients to live their best life. And of course, people who have been sent home to die by the medical institution as well. So Dr. Bob, welcome to the call. Always great to share some time with you and, and uh, learn some new things from you. How is all in Houston today? Well, Houston, we're at the pinnacle of summer. So, you know, if you're on the Fahrenheit scale, my thermometer, my car read 105 degrees. That's even warm for this part of the world. But you know what? I love it. It's, it's such a beautiful place to live, a beautiful time to be alive. Uh, and, you know, your goal of reaching 100,000, well, I promise you there's at least 100,000, probably more like 7.8 billion that could benefit from the information we're going to talk about because respiration is life critical. You know, that's, that's the most critical thing that we do. And very few of us do it in a way that's ideal for us. Uh, just when it comes to respiratory system itself, Dr. Bob, how does that work? How is it all connected? What's going on under the surface that we just don't really pay attention to on a daily basis? Well, Eric, the things we don't pay attention to are the things that we really can't see. So, you know, there's plenty of people out there that are mouth breathers. And that's not part of our respiratory system. We ought to be eating with this and breathing with this. This is our connection to the outside world. This is where our brain actually touches the outside world. Uh, and when you start breathing in through your nose, you know, there's a whole series of things that happen inside the nose. The air is filtered. It's actually moisturized. Uh, and a lot of experts will say it's actually ionized within our nose. There's these things called turbinates. And when they create a particular slow, uh, swirl of energy, they energize our body in a very particular way. And then ultimately it starts going down through our trachea, into our bronchus, into our bronchioles, into our alve alveoli. Uh, and that's where the exchange of gases occur. But there's so many things occurring below the surface but if you breathe in through your nose, you get that ionization, you get that moisturizing, you get that filtering. If you breathe in through your mouth, you lose those three big benefits. So one of the things that I found fascinating is, is they used to train Indians. Indians would train their warriors to run with water in their mouth. Now, somehow, some way, they just plain knew that if their mouth was closed and they were breathing through their nose, they'd do better. And now modern science has said, you know what, that works for elite athletes. It also works for the critically ill. If we breathe through our nose, we get healthier. Just when you mentioned that, it brought me back to my childhood, Dr. Bob, when you said about the, uh, the mouthful of water when breathing through your nose. I had a coach when I was younger taught me this. I used to hyperventilate as a young athlete. As I was a terribly poor, I was a poor loser, didn't like losing <laughs> at all. I was very competitive. But whether it was particularly with badminton or sprinting, I found sometimes I became very huffy and puffy when I'd lose my mental focus and my, my, my composure. I would find myself always shifting into that, that mouth breathing. And it really was a recipe for disaster because I ended up not being my best self and letting myself down and not performing the way I should have. And I learned that kind of the hard way. And do, do you see this commonly with people who, who struggle with respiratory challenges that they are predominantly mouth breathers? Well, it's not just those who struggle. It's those that don't even know that they're struggling, you know? So, you know, five different books on breathing that I read the summaries and, and, you know, even some of the complete data. And it's beyond amazing how important ideal breathing is. But Eric, I'm, I'm going to give you a, an interesting quote from Vince Lombardi. He said, show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. You know, Michael Jordan absolutely hated losing. Uh, and he was so serious about it. And look at where that took him. And I've had patients that would come to me and they'd say, Bob, describe yourself. Do you prefer winning or do you hate losing? You know what? I'm not, I'm not that terribly competitive. So I said, I like winning. And he said, you know what? I hate losing. Uh, and guess what? Multi-gazillionaire with accolades uh, in his seventh decade. And at 70, one of the biggest, best beasts. And when I say biggest, biggest in terms of bigger than life ideal body composition, super strong at 70, because he, he basically hates losing. He does, doesn't want to lose at anything. So 
that's probably a little insight as to why you succeed at the level you do. So, you know, congratulations. I think we do need to temper it a little bit so that, you know, we, we you know, in my case, I, I can tell you, I used to be more competitive. One of my first dates with my wife, I, I absolutely annihilated her at a game of pool and she wanted to slap me and, and said, you're no fun. I don't think I ever want to play with you again. You know, so if we're, if we're playing someone that, you know, if we're overshadowing them, maybe let them get a few points, you know, make, make it a little competitive. Well, you know what they say, Dr. Bob, if, if people pick up on the fact that you're letting them win, then I, I think they appreciate you less. That's probably why she married you, Dr. Bob. You beat her in the first game. I believe that's, uh, uh, I'm, I may have uh, beaten these on our first game of pool, actually on our first date, which is ironic, but there we go. <laughs> uh, always fun to explore that, but also exploring our, our competitive nature in a way that's constructive, not destructive. And most certainly I found for myself shifting out of that control breath wasn't good and really I, I kind of left being present and this is something I, I was reading uh, yesterday actually about being present and standing in good posture it becomes an almost like an open portal for you to be the most creative self you can be your happiest self your most genuine self if you are deeply breathing in a good stance good posture you are truly present at any given moment whereas if you close your breath close your posture close yourself off, things started to become distant from the present. And, and we kind of miss these moments in life. I think that's a, a bit of a tragedy in itself. Well, if we look at posture, you know, you're right on the money with that. So Amy Cuddy, you know, gave a TED talk on power postures. And some of the books that I read on breathing compared Clark Kent slumped over, you know, feeble guy to Superman standing upright, chest up, shoulders down and back. Uh, and you know, we, we even now know that our posture impacts our hormones. So we have more dominant, successful hormones standing upright, shoulders back, and less stress hormones, and vice versa. And that's in both men and women. So, you know, taking that deep breath, having that good posture, having that chest upright, those shoulders down and back, critical to wellness. And it might just be that it's the oxygenation that's the critical key there. You know, I wonder if we put people in a better posture and plug their nose and they've done no studies. They, they obstruct people's nasal cavities and their entire physiology is disrupted in a very short period of time and in, in not a good way, in a very unhealthy way. Fascinating connections between all the, the mechanisms and systems of the body. And there are a lot of people struggling today, I know with, with certain respiratory challenges and illnesses that are presenting themselves. What are some of the most prevalent of those illnesses that are, are showing up today, Dr. Bob, when it comes to respiratory health? You know, Eric, when I, when I Googled this, it actually said that asthma was the most common respiratory illness. Uh, but you know what? Why don't we just go with the common cold? Because most people are going to be exposed to the common cold. And about one third of those common colds over time have basically been, you know, coronaviruses, which is so fascinating there. So you start looking probably upper respiratory infection, most common, then we get into asthma, then we get into things like allergies, and then we get into bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, uh, uh, emphysema, you know, that and chronic bronchitis are in the category of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and that's not a pleasant existence. And then we might even go to lung cancer, which is one of the most lethal cancers out there. So those are the list of the most common things that people experience. But you know, I've, I've said for years, my first law, we called it Rakowski's law, healthy bodies don't get sick. That was my first law. Uh, and I've had yet to have anybody d dispute that, you know, if we're ideally healthy, we're not going to get sick. And it may just be the starting point is that good breath. And for many, if they actually discipline themselves to breathe appropriately, it may just be the thing that changes their entire life around for the better. You mentioned with asthma being one of the top issues that people may have with their respiratory system. That's usually accompanied, from my understanding, from a GP's point of view, with an inhaler or some form of strategy of medication. But where does functional medicine come in, Dr. Bob? What, what would you prescribe to someone who comes in demonstrating some of these illnesses? What's the functional medicine approach to that? Well, Eric, we want to know what's causing the problem. And, and so you look at the medical literature and it's very clear, they call asthma a silent inflammatory condition of the airways. And then you look at the medical model and they say, well, there's no cure. But then they say, but oddly enough, there's people that seem to grow out of it where they have a lifetime remission. So here's the deal. If it can be resolved in one, why don't we find the common factor and attempt to resolve it in all? 
So it would be anti-inflammatory. Now, breathing appropriately, here's a, a very fascinating thing, Eric, and this is in the research just last week to this week that I came across this. When we take a nasal breath, the chemistry of our nose that turbinates the mucous membranes and, and the filtering, they actually increase nitric oxide. Nitric oxide dilates blood vessels, dilates airways, and in and of itself could actually be a cure for what's going on. When people become progressively inflamed, they deplete nitric oxide and they can have that silent inflammatory condition of the airways. So, you know, what's the functional medicine point of view? Eat right, drink right, think right, move right, sleep right, poop right, talk right every day. If we break those down, eat right, an anti-inflammatory diet, if God made it, it's okay, if man made it, stay away, stay away from refined foods, simple starches, uh, drink right, you know, water, and, and we like extremely turbo potentized coffee and tea infused with top superfood on the planet, reishi. Think right, when you buffer your stress, you're gonna breathe more effectively and even think to keep your shoulders down and back, your chest expanded. Move right, the primary movement of the diaphragm, most people don't move their diaphragm as much. They don't get that good deep belly breathing. They don't expand the chest. And the very first biomarker of, of healthy aging that I came across over 30 years ago, I, I wanted to break it down and say, what do we know about healthy aging? Primary marker 30 years ago was considered vital capacity. How deep a breath could you take? How expansive were your lungs and rib cage and, and diaphragm being part of that? Sleep right, sleep's an anti-inflammatory. If you're breathing through your nose, uh, they have people that are recommending taping your mouth shut when you breathe. Uh, and this author that I read, he said his life changed by taping his mouth shut. But yet, he, I only did it for a couple of days because it was so annoying. Then I read his story. He says, day one, I kept it on for five minutes. It was so annoying. Day two, 10 minutes. By the end of the week, I slept through the night. And monitoring his sleep, he slept better. So sleep better. Uh, poop right, well, that's detoxification if you're intoxicated. And poor air quality, by the way, is associated with asthma. And then let's look at this. I'll share, uh, maybe I'll bring up the slide, but they found out that children that are vaccinated within the first year of life, dramatic increased risk of developing uh, autoimmunity. So, you, you, uh, sorry, of, of developing asthma and autoimmunity. So when we start looking at that, we want to start protecting our kids and then talk right. You know, how about just being conscious? You know, tell yourself, I want to be conscious of my posture, of my breathing and how I show up in the world. Uh, and all those things can help. Beautiful. Actually, I'd, I'd love to see those studies if you're going to bring them up in a moment, uh, Dr. Bob. Uh, you mentioned about the diaphragm as well. You know, why is it so important for us to get that deep diaphragmatic breath when it comes to our healing parasympathetic state and this lateral rib expansion, as I was mentioning on Clubhouse yesterday? Uh, this is kind of an area of real estate in the body that's not explored enough, but has such great gifts in order for us to decompress and control that stress response. Could you just touch on the, the engaging of the parasympathetic or, or healing state in the body and why is that so important? Yeah, and so here's what is known through the studies, what we're gonna call a deep diaphragmatic breath. Uh, you know, picture when, when people are in a fight or flight mode, they're, they're basically not breathing deep, they're huffing and puffing. And they're basically anaerobic, so they actually don't even need as much oxygen. But Navy SEALs are trained, you know, that very first breath that you take in a firefight should be a deep diaphragmatic breath. Breathe in, let that belly expand. I think it's interesting that it's the oldest or the first thing we learn, but also the first thing most people unlearn as well is that quality breath. It, I yeah. think it really needs to be taught to people, Dr. Bob, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's no surprise that breath work is, is on the rise as, as, a, as a practice, you know, with the likes of certain people like Wim Hof, but you say you're up on screen, go ahead. Yeah, there it is. So notice what it says, original article, analysis of health outcomes in vaccinated and unvaccinated children, looking at developmental delays, which increased by 218% in the vaccinated, asthma, which increased by 449% in the vaccinated, ear infections, which increased 213% in the vaccinated, uh, and gastrointestinal disorders. Uh, and so when you look at that, they, they looked at really the first year of life. So uh, when you start looking at beyond that, you know, the results are even more profound. So probably a couple other things that I'll bring up there too, 
Here's one thing we know, if moms were profoundly stressed, we have an epigenetic imprint on the baby, they're a lot more likely to develop asthma in their early years uh, when people have, uh, when they live in areas of air pollution, again, a lot more asthma. So we're seeing a lot of factors come in. And you, know, you have to wonder how many kids weren't vaccinated in their first year of life? Probably not that many. And we see this global pandemic of asthma. How many are living in polluted environments? Way too many. How many people had moms that were stressed during pregnancy? Way too many. What we're beginning to see is if we put a child in a healthy mother in a healthy environment and we don't intoxicate them, and I would say for literally no reason in their first year of life, they're going to do a, a whole lot better. And just speaking of medical practices when it comes to kids or anyone really, when anyone presents with, a, let's say, a respiratory tract infection coming into their, their GP, a lot of times they, they end up being put on an antibiotic, which is pretty common. I know we spoke about antibiotics before when it comes to respiratory issues, uh, but it's, it's not really a long-term solution for that. Is there a better way than just going down the antibiotic route and taking the prescription? You know, it's, it's, it's never the only route and it's never a long-term solution. Uh, but, you know, Joseph Mercola, very interesting character. He's got, he had at one time, it was the most popular health promoting website on the planet. Uh, and he got shut down. He got censored. In fact, they threatened to kick, kick him off of all platforms because he was sharing natural remedies for, for a recent virus. But he interviewed a medical doctor that was a big fan of what we call nebulizing hydrogen peroxide. So I'm going to share my screen again. I'll share the PubMed study. But ultimately, if they put hydrogen peroxide uh, directly diluted in this little mister called a nebulizer, and it's a, it's a portable device. And uh, you know this one, I think, was $39, $39.95. So this 2021 PubMed study, hydrogen peroxide is a widely used, highly accessible, and available chemical whose compound efficacy has been demonstrated on several human viruses, including coronavirus and influenza viruses. That's 2021 PubMed. Well, we go a little further, if you were to look up hydrogen peroxide, it's how our white blood cells actually kill yeast, parasite, fungus, bacteria. And what this doctor said, he said it very boldly. He said, no one should ever have a sinus or upper respiratory infection ever again. If they would, he was under the impression, and this was after treating many thousands of patients with nebulized hydrogen peroxide. He said, no one ever needs one of these infections again. So if you look at antibiotics, well, what percentage of upper respiratory infections are, are bacterial? I don't know the answer to that, but I would suggest it's a minor amount. Uh, and then you look at virus, virus is most common. What do antibiotics do against virus? Absolutely nothing. And so uh, I don't know if I, I might have a beautiful friend, Bonita Harris, uh, she's a doctor uh, in Atlanta, but she said, Dr. Bob, uh, I wanna share with you this info on uh, nebulizing hydrogen peroxide when she saw that we were talking about breathing. Now I wanna give a big shout out to Bonita. Thank you for calling that to my attention. Uh, there's other doctors that say you can do an iodine solution because iodine is profound, powerfully anti-infective, again, a, 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 including viruses, bacteria, et cetera. So powerful, powerful stuff. So certainly with the bacterial uh, respiratory infection, th that would require an antibiotic, Dr. Barb, or, or no. without run its course? No, no not, not, not require. Just and, and so if we keep in mind, is the antibiotic gonna work? We don't know till we try, but is it gonna kill off your regular microbiome? It absolutely is. What this doctor said, if you actually nebulize hydrogen peroxide, you would not disrupt the healthy microbes within your body, and it is antibacterial as well. And again, he made the statement, powerful statement. He says, no one ever needs to have a respiratory infection again. That's a pretty powerful statement. Sure is. I can see why they'd like to censor that chap. But there we go, right? Uh, a lot of money to be lost when the information comes out that doesn't serve a narrative. When it comes to the approach from Wim Hof, we see his breath work has, has kind of come to the forefront after the last, I guess, 10, 8 to 10 years because he's been so out there with some of his experiments and showing what the body is capable of and sharing his journey of deep pain and then discovery of the cold and and deeper breath work. What have you seen from, from the likes of his exposure and, and coaching for people 
that is quite positive and is, is something that people should really look at. Well, you know, a big part of Wim Hof's therapies are breath work. And what's fascinating is breath work goes back thousands of years. We're talking about millennia. I mean, the monks would do it. The yogis would do it. It was, it was found to be absolutely critical to change your state. Now, I'll tell you, I've taken breath workshops and I've taken Wim Hof breath workshops. I've taken shamanic breathing workshops. And you just need a good hour of that type of thing to realize that it is profoundly impactful on your entire physiology. So Joe Rogan interviewed James Nestor who wrote the book, Breathe. Uh, and he had a lifetime of breathing problems and he went to a breathing coach and the guy said, look, just breathe through your nose, tape your mouth shut, breathe through your nose. And this guy found so many profound changes. He's dedicated his life to the study of it. But Joe Rogan asked him, you know, what about Wim Hof? He says, look, just breathe. You don't need to breathe through your mouth or nose. He says, what Wim Hof does is he has the people essentially hyperventilate to change their chemistry. And when they do that, as much as they do, they will drive the parasympathetic nervous system. They said, that's what they're going after. And Wim Hof has proven. Now, is he an outlier in his capacity? Absolutely. But he can control his autonomic nervous system to the point where he's measured changing the blood pressure in one arm while leaving it the same in the other. And we're not talking about a few points, we're talking 20, 30 points. So do we have, or do we have the potential to create more control of our health and wellness in life than we ever realized? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I really think that's the future, really getting in touch. So keep in, uh, in mind, one of the oldest and most powerful pieces of wisdom ever, know thyself. Well, how about knowing how you breathe and how it impacts your physiology and how to optimize it? Those would all be good things to know. It really demonstrates that we're touching the surface only on our potential, you know, for what we can actually do. So opening the doors to be curious, I think is such a, is a gift, you know, really pursue that, give it some time, discover it, learn more about yourself and be curious in every area, area of your life and, and get different opinions on things. But uh, I, I certainly thought that was fascinating to some of his journey and, and how he came through a ser serious struggle with the loss of his wife to really discover himself, as Dr. Bob just mentioned, know thyself. I think that was that Sun Tzu. I think he famously quoted with that. I think it could have been, but it may go uh, back what, that far. And it's been all over the world, though, many cultures. So it, it's yeah. not one culture that said it. Who said it first? I don't know. But it's, a, no, it's, it's an important tidbit of, of advice. It sure, it sure is. We'll tip, tip our hat to him anyway, if it was his. Uh, but when it comes to uh, this silly protocol of having these rags on our face for the last couple of years, Dr. Bob, what has been the, what has been the, the detriment to people's health from wearing these face masks over the last couple of years? Yeah, I don't know that we'll ever figure it out uh, for sure. But here's what we know. Uh, and I'll share two metaphors. One is very, very funny. But I heard one researcher say that you know, using a chain link fence as a mosquito net would be the equivalent of putting a rag on your face and thinking you were going to stop a, you know, a nanometer virus from getting in. And technically it was about a hundred nanometers, but the holes are much bigger than that. But one of my good friends, Jared Brennan said, well, I'm just going to tell patients, I think they can relate to this. It's like thinking that your underwear will actually trap your, your, your gas. He says, basically saying that your underwear will protect your fart from, in, you know, getting the other people. Well, I promise you, you know, if you're in a crowded room and, and uh, I wouldn't give that a try, you know, cause it would be about as effective as a mask. And, and, you know, it gets a lot of chuckles and I'm not seeing a lot of faces on there, but I'm seeing Adri chuckle. And you know what? I chuckled too. When I heard that, I thought that'll stick, you know, wearing a, a rag on your face, thinking you're going to stop a hundred nanometer virus is about the equivalent of thinking that you can wear a standard pair of underwear fart and, and not have anybody else detected. It's, it's just absurd. I also uh, heard about certain kids who are having uh, uh, rotting teeth and that because of the, I guess it's the recycled carbon dioxide through you know, that exposure blocking that respiratory pathway. I mean, it's, it's such a terrible thing for kids, to, especially, you know, if they're, they're eight hours a day in school or six or seven hours a day in school, and they're expected to have these on their face for such a long period of time, you can only imagine that there would be issues with oral health as well. You know, Eric, I, I wrote a whole bunch of medical exemptions to at least the parents that knew to think about it. Uh, and, and very, very simply, they were all granted where these kids didn't do it. I personally don't know why every parent didn't look and say, is this helpful? No, it's not. Is it harmful? Yes, it is. How can I get my kid out of it? 
and you know what a doctor can write an exemption and, and you know in texas it was easy enough to do uh and there was not one single kid whose medical exemption was refuted by the school so guess what were these kids sick no you know did, they didn't infect anybody they didn't get infected but what did they do they had a better day with better chemistry and physiology uh and in, instead of you know having days which you know those rotten teeth you're not going to undo that some of the damage to the chemistry that can be feed forward where people might have a lifetime of challenges and what are we seeing massively enhanced global death rate not among the pediatrics uh, i haven't seen those numbers but 18 to 44 oh my gosh the death rate is up you know nearly double around the world so what's going on here you know uh, I think we'll answer that time enough. You know, some people will say, well, it was the policies and, and the forced medical experiment, but the medical people will say, no, no, what happened was these people didn't go to doctors and they had something brewing and they didn't get it assessed and they're dead now for it. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not buying mm -hmm. that for a microsecond, not mm -hmm. for a microsecond. I'll and all the circle just keeps going around and around. Uh, you know, I, I, I was listening to someone else who's a bit of a, a rebel in the role right recently talking about resistance to policies and ideas that they know in their heart of hearts do not serve people. And his response was a nonviolent resistance and a stand. And like you just said there, it's just like when you ask the question and, and get an exemption and, and do your due diligence and really look at what information is being given to you, you really start to ponder on these things a whole lot deeper and probably need to take an extra few breaths on that as well. Let it resonate with you and, and see where it leaves you. But when it comes to our superfood, the king of all herbs, Ganoderma, also known as Reishi or Ling Tzu, you mentioned about a Nobel Prize winning molecule uh, of nitric oxide earlier on the call and, and the connection between this and our ability to breathe and dilate blood vessels. How powerful is our favorite superfood, Dr. Bob, that we have in our daily coffee and tea and share with the world and this is a core part of our mission to help people around the globe be healthier, breathe better. How powerful is it for the airwaves and for our overall health? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from the medical literature. So one is that Ganoderma or Reishi is a powerful regulator, modulator of nitric oxide. It especially reduces the most destructive form, inflammatory nitric oxide. Uh, but the medical literature says that it dilates airways by more mechanisms than prescription inhalers. Uh, and so I'll share that screen in that PubMed because I, I think it's just that powerful and people need to know you know, if you were going to go and, and do something for your wellness, it seems that, you know, this would be near the top of your list. But Ganoderma modulates airways, opens airways by more mechanisms than prescription inhalers. And the PubMed ID is 2600413. Uh, and it's also a very powerful allergy modulator, which is a big part of what happens uh, with asthma. And so if we can get rid of the cause, all the better. Uh, and then the nitric oxide connection, powerful, uh, Nobel Prize winning, and it spills over not just airways, but immune system and sexual function and brain chemistry uh, and really longevity. I wouldn't doubt that if it doesn't already exist, I didn't Google this, but I, I, it might be interesting to look at nitric oxide status and longevity. But I did Google one thing about uh, vital capacity, breathing and longevity. Uh, and let me, let me share this study with you, which is so fascinating. They've actually mapped out how long people are projected to breathe with lung function as quantified by something called a, sp a spirometer. It actually measures how deep of breaths that you can take. And notice when people were above average breathing, you know, they kept lung function into their 90s, meaning they were gonna live that long. And people that were lowest, you know, they were typically gone by about age 62. So you're looking at 30 extra years and certainly quality years. And that's a 2021 study. So ultimately, people that breathe better will live better longer. Awesome. And of course, we also have a cordyceps as well to share with people. And I find particularly with that for training performance, the combination of reishi and cordyceps in our delivery systems are particularly beneficial and just allow you to do more with the body. So whether it's you're breathing for just general well-being and your health, or you're breathing for that next level of performance and energy output, 
how effective is the combo of, of medicinal mushrooms like cordyceps and reishi as a, as a duo? So there's a gentleman named Elliot Kipchoge who, run the, who ran the sub two hour marathon. Uh, and how did he do it? With reishi and cordyceps and good training. And you know, there, there's a lot of other things that came into it. But you know, there was actually an Irishman, Stevie McEwen. I don't know if you know Stevie, but I did a nutrition consult with him about eight years ago. Sure. Uh, he ran a hundred marathons in a hundred days and actually got faster along the way. And he consumed the red tea with reishi and cordyceps in it. And you start looking at that and you come to realize, wow, you know, if these elites are taking their game up and here's what I'll tell you, it's a lot harder to get an elite to pick up his, his game than it is, you know, to get someone who's very sick to get out of bed. But I'll, I'm actually going to share these two screens because it's, it's wonderful that you mentioned that, but, uh, I'll, I'll show the picture of Elliot Kipchoge with his sub two hour marathon uh, and Stevie McEwen. So there's Elliot uh, drinking that red tea with Ganoderm and Cordyceps. One hour, 59 minutes, 40 sec, 40.2 seconds to run, 26.2 miles. And Stevie McEwen, 100 marathons in 100 days. I mean, th these are amazing souls. And, and they both not only recognize the benefit, but put it to really good use for their cause. Excellent. Once again, just shows you what's possible with the human spirit, with the human body and the right fuel in order to get where you want to go and make your mark, whatever that is. You know, as, as I was saying last night, uh, just enjoying that conversation with Eric Worre, go big or go home and ask, ask a lot of yourself, fuel yourself well, invest in yourself well. And I think you can create some epic results in this journey of life. I see just a couple of questions that came through uh, via Instagram directly on this topic. Dr. Bob, if we could just touch on those. I see a couple of questions in the chat and we'll wrap up the call. Uh, first question was, uh, what will help those with TB and HIV to breathe better and to counter negative effects of medications? Well, first thing we want to do is breathe through the nose. And, and so if, uh, and, and even close your mouth. So if people really want to deep dive, get the book Breathe by James Nestor and really look at that. But, you know, when you breathe better and you function better and you're driving the parasympathetic nervous system, that's really good for the immune system. Uh, and then go to pubmed.gov and, and type in Ganoderma and HIV. Uh, and here's what the literature says. Ganoderma has several uh, proteases that block replication of HIV. So very, very, very powerful there. So uh, breathing better is going to be part of that. And then we, the other one was tuberculosis. So, TB uh, and HIV, yeah. yeah. So, you know, mycobacterium tuberculosis, it might even be the same patient because uh, people that are immunocompromised tend to be getting that. Tuberculosis has been around for a long, long time. Uh, you know, again, Ganoderma, Reishi, a very powerful anti-infective. It might just be fun to do a PubMed search and see if that's effective against TB as well. Uh, I'm very, very curious about that. So I'm just going to type it in. Ganoderma plus, I'll, I'll even spell it out, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Seven results. Now I go to, and I'll share our screen. For those of you on Instagram can't see it, but you can go to pubmed.gov, type in Ganoderma uh, and mycobacterium tuberculosis. And Here's what we see, seven studies specifically against TB. Uh, and uh, you know, this one here is entitled 2017, anti-tubercular, meaning anti-tuberculosis activity, uh, again, of Ganoderma lucidum, uh, and pretty powerful that it's been studied against TB. So you know, is there help or hope for these people? I don't see why not. Uh, by the way, I also like, and let, let's just for the fun of it, type in hydrogen peroxide. I could have copied it because I have to really think letter by letter how to spell out mycobacterium tuberculosis. Mm. Uh, but 271 studies about hydrogen peroxide. Pretty fascinating. Notice what this one's called. Use of hydrogen peroxide vapor for deactivation of mycobacterium tuberculosis in a biologic safety cabinet room. 2007 study. So, uh, you know, very, very powerful. So Ganoderma, cordyceps, nebulized hydrogen peroxide, maybe even a little iodine. I might even type in iodine. Uh, it, it seems like, you know what, if we really seep, we will find. So I'm glad people asked that question. How about that? 109 studies on iodine uh, and tuberculosis. So notice 
you know, if you looked up antibiotics, hey, not very effective. You look up these natural molecules, very effective. Well, what's the problem with the natural molecules? They can't be patented. And that means people can't make a, you know, an insane fortune with you know, thousand X markup on it. But I, I like as, you know, and one of my mentors says that this is a great time of awakening where people are going to really look and say, do I really want these synthetic chemicals that are new and haven't been proven? Or do I want stuff that's been around forever that is proven? Pretty powerful. Beautiful. Thank you for searching that. Another question there was, how do you have better control in cold weather, especially a sudden cold spell for asthmatics? Well, uh, again, we wouldn't wait for a crisis to be proactive. And, and so what they're finding is they actually change airways. And so uh, they change the structure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a couple more screens here quickly because I really love this guy. I mean, this guy really struggled with breathing. Uh, and here's what he says, you know, humans have lost the ability to breathe correctly. So that's the title of his book, Breathe. Uh, and then in his, his podcast with Joe Rogan, what they actually show is if you breathe appropriately, you expand the sinuses, you expand the airways. If you, you, if you don't use it, you lose it. And they're even suggested that these crowded teeth and all these other things that are going on from these mouth breathers uh, are problematic. So um, let, let's just look at this real quick. Someone who's a mouth breather, they're gonna have tired eyes, restless sleep, uh, a setback or recessed jaw, they'll have a forward head posture, something palate, there must be something wrong with their palate, probably not expanding, lower carbon dioxide and oxygenation, higher blood pressure and stress activation. None of that is good for health or the immune system. And look at how profoundly different the faces are and the postures. So Eric, one of the things that they went through in this book was they actually looked at skulls going back a few hundred years uh, and they were certainly better than today in terms of structure and teeth. But when they go back thousands of years, these caveman skulls, no dental decay, very broad mouths, very well-developed sinuses and air passages, we lost the ability to breathe and it's leading to a de-evolution. So, you know, we want to breathe appropriately through our nose. We certainly do. That seems to be a common theme for sure. Uh, a couple of questions here uh, also from Instagram. Is there uh, certain foods that can help detoxify the lungs? So understand that inflammation is one of the factors that's very destructive to the airways. So an anti-inflammatory diet, if God made it, it's okay. If man made it, stay away. Are there lung specific herbs? Cordyceps is absolutely one of the best. You know, does it have benefits for other things? Plenty, but really, really, really good for lung function. And what was the second part of that with inhaler? Is it okay to use an inhaler twice a day? And then also from the, uh, another gentleman was, I've been prescribed an inhaler, but I, f I feel worse after using it. Well, I mean, if you need something to get from where you are to where you want to be, the guidelines on medication are the lowest dose and the shortest duration. We have shown that Ganoderma dilates or Reishi dilates the airways by more mechanisms than prescription inhalers. So that's going to be part of it. Uh, now, if you feel worse, there's something about it that's not really mixing well with your system. Often those are corticosteroids. Uh, and those are bad for overall health. They're bad for the immune system. They're bad for inflammatory process. They can cause osteoporosis. They can cause depression. They can cause neurodegeneration. So your body's probably giving you a hint and saying, yeah, this isn't the best thing for me. Okay, we're just coming to a close here on, on questions. I'll just address the ones that are in the chat there. Adri's asking, um, my aunt is diagnosed with labyrinthitis. Any advice? Well, that's an inflammatory process of uh, the inner ear. So an anti-inflammatory diet, part of that could be you know, uh, cranial manipulation with a, with a good, uh, skilled practitioner, but itis means inflammation. So good omega threes, reishi helpful there and an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, a question here as well. My husband has Churg, uh, Churg Strauss, also known as, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that because like eosinophilic I granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Thank you for backing me up on that one, Dr. Puff. Um, he works too, uh, too hard for the NHS. I see how the stress of his role is affecting him. I would love to be able to encourage him to do more for himself. What five things would you recommend to improve his lung capacity, uh, reduce his asthma and give him a better chance of, of running around the park without stopping? Um, she, uh, this is from Sarah. She drinks OG, but uh, he, is, he is refusing. 
as I'm now starting to trade, this might change. Well, so when you, when you start getting all these questions, anything eosinophilic means it's allergy, and that means the immune system is not ideally regulated. So go to my YouTube channel, look up immune modulation, which is good for allergy or autoimmunity, but there's a six-tier approach that's proven in the medical literature. So you're gonna get six instead of five, but you're gonna seal and heal the gut. Uh, you're going to give some nutrients that are very well known to enhance or reduce the inflammatory process. That would be DHEA, which is over the counter here in this part of the world, the activated form of omega-3s, vitamin D through it, and I like it with a K2 combination. Uh, and then the two Chinese botanicals, reishi and perilla seed. Uh, and so if we modulate the inflammatory process and the allergy response, we can help them get better. And it's also known that bioflavonoids are very, very good for uh, allergy response. And uh, quercetin has been getting a lot of press lately because it seems to have extra benefit for people with a, a popular or maybe not so popular modern virus, but one that's in a lot in the literature. So you got six things, but go to my YouTube channel and, and invite them to the replay, uh, you know, share this with them. You know, it, I, I am sometimes amazed, you know, it sometimes it takes a near death experience for people to be inspired to change. And even guess what? Some people near death isn't enough. They have to get to death, you know, and then, then they, they transition to hopefully, uh, and in my belief system, a, a, you know, no more pain, no more suffering. So, uh, but you know, if they want to be around longer and healthier, make healthy, healthy choices. For sure. Experience certainly trumps knowledge, but the knowledge helps for those who need it. Uh, last year rose the question I had COVID. The scariest part is trying to breathe in oxygen, which is all year round. Uh, I was suffocating. Thank God I had Reishi red tea with me. Uh, I made it uh, ASAP almost immediately. My lungs opened up and I was able to breathe again. I also developed painful lumps on my head. Uh, Dr. Bob told me to increase my intake of mycelium, which I did, and it went down, thank God, with the guidance of Dr. Bob, which is uh, awesome to hear. Um, Claudio is starving your body of oxygen, but only negatively compound and worsen your environment. Certainly will. I'm sure we, uh, we could agree with you on that as well. Last question then is, Dr. Bob, how do you know if your nose breathing while you're asleep? You tape uh, your mouth you know, shut. You tape your mouth shut. Uh, and, and, you know, what's, what's fascinating is I tried that. You know, I, I, I tried it many, many years ago when I read about it. And it was so obnoxious. I, I didn't even make it through the second night. Uh, but James Nestor said it took him a week to get used to it. I went on Amazon and I, he said, you know, picture a Charlie Chaplin mustache just a little lower. Uh, and ultimately they have these little X strips that you go across. So if you need to get your mouth open on the corner is fine. But, you know, taping your mouth shut can be really, really, really powerful. So consider that. We've covered all the questions. Great, great call. Uh, Dr. Bob, really, really appreciate it. I know you probably have to get back to the clinic soon. So we will leave the call there. We will be revisiting this topic at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Dr. Bob will be for the second call uh, of the day. And of course, we will be having a conversation around our business, sharing our digital franchise on Saturday at 7.15 GMT or, or 1.15 Central Standard Time. So guys, go be brilliant. Next week, we're touching on sexual function. And it's a, obviously an important topic as well for, for us as humans, as we procreate and uh, express ourselves. So we'll be touching on that and everything around holistic health and functional medicine in that regard as well. So Dr. Bob, thank you so much for sharing this uh, time with us. Your knowledge was just unbelievable as always. Everyone on Zoom, thank you for joining us on Instagram as well. We really appreciate you coming here and all your questions. So have an epic day. I'll leave the last comments to you, Dr. Bob, to close out the call. I'll just close with this. I'm Dr. Bob Rakowski absolutely knowing that we can all be happy, healthy, and successful. So good night in that part of the world, good day in this part of the world, and God bless to all everywhere.